Pray, Father, here we thank you for another opportunity to come tonight. Father, we pray right now as we as saints in the body of Christ, as we study together, that we will be encouraged tonight in your holy word, that we'll be edified and by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit, that we will be enlightened, Lord Jesus. And we thank you for this platform. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, if we look uh, in the book of Romans, Paul just lays out a definite course, a very definitive course uh, to salvation. He lays out the plan for salvation. And along the way are some important signposts, because I always want to get this in the gospel, my brothers and sisters. And the problem is we are without excuse and guilt before a holy and righteous God. Paul used the law as proof of that guilt. He said, every time we break God's law, it testifies of our sinfulness. Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 says, for the ways of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, my brothers and sisters. Salvation cannot be earned. I want you to understand that. Many folks thinking they can work their way to heaven. You can't, my brothers and sisters. You can't work your way to heaven. Everyone is a sinner and deserves death, but God gives eternal life. And how he gives eternal life is that we believe the gospel. And that is that Jesus Christ died, that he was buried, and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel by which we must believe in order to be saved and be justified until eternal life. All right, my brothers, so tonight uh, we're going to look at a few verses uh, as we go into this study. In 1 Corinthians 4.10, Paul said, We are fools for Christ's sake, uh, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong, um, and ye are honorable, but we are despised. Uh, then Paul goes on to say in Philippians 4, 6 through 7, what he tells us, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. You see, let your requests be made known. Now we're going to get into that. And the peace of God which pass all understanding shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. Now let me say this tonight. The sufferings of this present time is not the same as the sufferings for Christ's sake. Now, Apostle Paul, he gloried in his infirmities, wants his request, when we talk about that thorn in flesh, a line, in other words, it was in line with what God, God's will is for us in the dispensation of grace. He is more than willing to suffer for Christ's sake and be looked upon as the filth of the world. Now, the proclamation of God's words does not need to be accompanied by any apologies from us, my brothers and sisters. Don't know apologies from us. It doesn't have to be repackaged by us so that it is foolishness, it, that, that, is, that is foolishness of preaching and our offense of the cross are eliminated or so that the tradition shaking effects of it, right division will be lessened. What it does need is to be boldly stood for and clearly proclaimed by us, knowing full well what that many mean, what that many, and what that mean to us. Second Corinthians 2, 17, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God speak we in Christ. And look what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 through 5, but as we are well allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which tries our hearts. For neither at any time use, we use what flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covenants. My brother says, God is witness. In Galatians 1.10, look what Paul says, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. In the light of all this, consider just a few of the many times in our epistles that Paul exhorts us to be us both to expect and to put up with the effects of being as the filth of the world and the off scorn of all things. Second Corinthians 1 5 For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, 
so our consolation also abounded by Christ. Now look at this, Philippians 1, 29 through 30. Look what Paul says here tonight. For unto you is given in this behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Now those are some very important words right there. That last phrase right there, to suffer, it says, for his sake, for his sake having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. And then 1 Thessalonians 3, look at what Paul says, 3 to 4, that no man should be moved by these afflictions for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For very, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass and ye know. And then look at what Paul says. We're talking about suffering tonight. A lot of folks don't want to suffer. I'm not talking about the sufferings of the present time. Those are the things that we're going to, it's going to happen no, no matter what. But the sufferings for Christ's sake, that's a choice for us, my brothers and sisters. 1 Timothy 4.10, for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, expressed of those that believe. And then 2 Timothy 2 and 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, being made, let me say this, being made as the filth of the world, and the offscoring of all things should not surprise us. It should be expected by us. It is the common lot of faithful who preach the gospel of grace and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. We can never, let me say this, as you go through your sufferings, and some folks don't want to endure sufferings. That's why the word of God says, Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. See that right there? You can live godly in Christ Jesus. You, you can choose not to. But if you live godly in Christ Jesus, you're going to suffer persecution. So, let me say this tonight. We can never force God to do something He's not doing today. Maybe he did it. He did do it in the past. My brothers and sisters. And, and, and that was time past. He did it. But now in the, in the dispensation of grace, we need to understand the difference in time past and but now. You see, and we are quoting Bible verses on the impression he will behave that way for us. And that's what many false teachers do. They just go grab scripture out of context. Um, this is what me and my wife, when we were studying the other day, we were talking about how folks are so easily tossed to and fro because they never go and be a Berean. And they never go search the scriptures for themselves. They go to church. They listen to the pastor. They go home. They never open up their Bibles to see what the pastor preached. Well, so they just take him for his word. My brother says, so they don't know if he done, he done threw what he wanted to throw in there because they never searched the scriptures for themselves. So this is just how the nomination of treats the scriptures citing Bible passages without recognizing to and about to whom they were spoken or written is, is dangerous. It would lead to frustration, misunderstanding, even an outright abandonment of the Bible. Denominational systems rely so heavily on verse quoted out of context. And that's what usually you look at all these assemblies on Sunday morning. Some preacher or pastor has taken a verse and taken it out of context. They just pulled it and they're taking it out of context. Some of them might take verses that you can, about Jesus and his healing, and want to try to apply it in today's dispensation of grace. And that's not God's program today. You see, they take passages, not to or about us, and they assume these verses apply to us. Here's a sure way to open ourselves up to a host of uncertainties and disappointments. Satan, policy, and evil will use all of this as a doorway into our lives and let us not underestimate him. Let us heed the warnings of scripture. 
in accordance with the Paul warned the Corinthians about distancing themselves anymore from the afflictions of the gospel, and he exhorted them to follow him. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. Now, when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 4, 14 through 16, where he said, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you, wherefore I beseech you, be you followers of me. Now, let us keep in mind that being as the filth of the world and the offscoring all things is the only, is only the unimportant opinion of the world whose fashion will be done away with. That's how they can look at you. It is not, however, the opinion of God. To the Lord, we are unto God a sweet savior, savor of Christ. And that's the only opinion that ought to mean anything to us. So what we believe is evidenced by how we live. Are you glorying in Christ or man? Second Corinthians, Paul talked about this. Let's, let's, let's look at something right quick tonight. As we go into this, 2 Corinthians 2, when Paul 5 through 11, of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire the glory, I should not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear. Least any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And least should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation. Paul said, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. The messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might be depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, would I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, hmm, Paul responds when he fell in line with what God is doing today. Therefore, I take pleasures in infirmities and reproaches, meaning, he, and meaning reproach meaning shame, humiliation, looked upon as filth of the world for Christ's sake, in necessities and persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. I am become a fool in glory. Ye have compelled me for I ought to have been commended for you, for in nothing am I, behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. God heard Paul's three pleas for the thorn in the flesh to be removed. This was God's answer. You see, look at this, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, 9a. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. You see this? God didn't answer Paul with Paul. I'm going to move that thorn. God didn't answer, hey, Robinson, I'm going to heal that body for you. I'm going to take that sickness away, that pain away. He didn't say that. No, God says, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. He didn't say, Robinson. Since you live in God in Christ Jesus and suffer all this persecution, I'm going to take that persecution away from you. No, he did not. What he says, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. God gave Paul the reason for not removing the thorn in his flesh. Once Paul realized that the Lord was not going to remove his thorn in the flesh, Paul's response was in line with what God was and doing is doing in the dispensation of grace. Paul knew his purpose. And he also knew that as the Lord's ambassador boldly preaching the message of grace and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, was knowing Paul was it was knowing that his life was a life of suffering for Christ's sake. And that life meant being a fool for Christ's sake, and being looked upon as the filth of this world in this present evil world, a request for the Lord to strengthen him in his weakness rather than remove his weakness. So that's God's power would be on full display. 
That's what God was trying to let Paul see and let us see. That his full, when he says grace is there, it's sufficient. You'll see his, his full power being on, 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 on display, my brothers and sisters. Paul asked the Lord to remove his thorn in the flesh. Paul said, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. You don't have to go around because that ain't our program. Lord, take, take, take that sickness. Take all the heartaches and pains away from them, Lord. No. You tell folks God grace is sufficient. God has provided us and designed for us in our inner man some uh, words of comfort, words of peace that strengthen us in our inner man. You see, that's our program today. It's not a program of what Jesus had to the nation of Israel in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Heal the sick, raise the dead. That was that program. That's not God's program today. You see, now, Paul pleaded with the Lord, take it away from me. Now, Paul, prayer for deliverance from his suffering was answered, but not as we may expect. While God is certainly able to deliver us from our situation, I find that his will for me and believers who live under the dispensation of grace of God is that we are gonna suffer for Christ's sake. Ephesians 3, 2. And the mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1, 27. Is that we endure by availing ourselves of the ply of Christ and dwell in life as the grace of God. This new way of deliverance under the gospel of the grace of God is consistent with the situation when we see the apostle Paul besought the Lord three times to remove that thorn in the flesh. Once again, note that the Lord did not comply with Paul's request. No, no. He didn't say, he didn't say, I'm removing it, Paul. No, no. Rather, the Lord says, my grace is sufficient. And a lot of, a lot of saints in the body of Christ need to understand that. What God is saying here and understand the depths of this verse right here. When God says, my grace is sufficient. You see, the great grace we have received is the very life of Christ in us. Further, the Lord communicated to Paul that his thorn in the flesh, it was a message of Satan. I was permitted by God to buffet Paul, lest Paul be lifted with pride. When the Lord told Paul, my strength is made perfect in weakness, Paul was not the only one whom God expected to recognize that truth. The message of Satan was going to realize it too. And in turn, Satan himself would be confronted with it. In the dispensation of grace, the excellence of the power of God's word is not only being made manifest to us and for our appreciation, it is also being put on display to Satan and his cohorts. Knowing that we got God's grace, God is conf confronting them with the issue of the superiority of the power of his word working within his saints to successfully equip them and equip us to withstand and overcome any of our oppositions that we will encounter in this spiritual battle. And in this, God is glorified. With God having designed it so we can actually glorify him when we suffer for Christ's sake. It is little wonder that Paul was not ashamed to do so. It is little wonder that he gloried in his infirmities and said, therefore, I take pleasures in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, Paul says, then I'm strong. Why am I strong? Because I'm resting in what? Not I can, what I can do, but what God, what God can do in his power, his strength. 2 Corinthians 12, 10, talk about suffer for Christ's sake. Was a gift of God that Paul gladly received. He understood the significance and privilege wrapped up in those three words, for Christ's sake. Therefore, he wanted the gift. 
He cherished the gift and he rejoiced over the gift. May we as ones to whom the same gift is given learn to do likewise and not refuse the gift as it is so often done. Many in the body of Christ don't want to suffer. They don't want to get persecuted. They don't want to get humiliated. They don't want to be looked upon as the filth of the world. Paul can say that he's given the suffering for Christ. Let me stop and interject something in this message. And that is the sufferings. I need to explain this right quick. The sufferings of this present time is not the same as the suffering for Christ's sake. I think folks need to understand that. They, folks don't understand that when they go through sickness and, and all these heartaches and tragedies in life and all these sufferings that they, of the present time, you got to understand that's not the same as suffering for Christ's sake. Also, suffering from our own poor choices and decisions is not the same as suffering for Christ's sake also. Sometimes we suffer because of the decision we made and the choices we made in life. Paul says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Romans 8, 18. My brothers and sisters, the sufferings of this present time are just that. The suffering that we experience during the present time because of the bondage of corruption. And it came in when Adam sinned. That still grips creation. In common with all creation, we suffer the effects of corruption as we eagerly await the redemption of our bodies. That's why these old frames, these bodies, they're going back to the dust. They're perishing. They're corrupted, my brothers and sisters. Hence, Paul said, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain unto together unto now. And not only they, but ourselves also. We have the first fruits of the spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our bodies, our glorified bodies. As corruption take its toll. The whole creation, including ourselves, grown it and travail it in pain. Sickness, disease, decay, and death, along with other effects of corruption like accidents, bloodshed, pestilence, all these catastrophic events that takes place, being victims of crime and evil and the like, are all our common lot. And that's for the saved and the unsaved. Hence, pain and suffering because of the bondage of corruption will be experienced by us for as long as the dispensation of grace continues. This, once again, we have in common with all creations. So, therefore, the sufferings of this present time are not to be thought of of us as suffering for Christ's sake. However, suffering for Christ's sake is not something that common to man. Most folks, they don't like to experience pain. They don't like to experience heartaches, persecutions, um, being talked about. You see, however, let me say this. Suffering for Christ's sake is not something that is common to man. Rather, it is a kind of suffering that only can come upon us who belong to Christ as we become the objects of of both the world's hatred of Christ and Satan despising of us. And that only can happen if you're living godly in Christ Jesus. If you're out there with the message for today in the dispensation of grace and you're preaching Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery and you're explaining to folks the, the difference between uh, what right division is and the distinction between time past and but now, the nation of Israel, prophecy, and the body of Christ, and the mystery. My brothers and sisters, that's the kind of suffering you're going you're gonna to come across. Paul introduced us to reality, this special kind of suffering, further on in Romans 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nexus or pearl or soil as it is written for thy sake? We are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Romans 8, 35 through 36. As Paul showed by citing the similar situation described. In Psalm 44, 22, the sufferings that he talks about here are for thy sake. 
Therefore, they are not suffering that are simply common to man. Instead, they are suffering for Christ's sake. And I want you to understand that. When you witness, uh, you go through death and all those things, my brothers and sisters, those are not suffering for Christ's sake. Those are suffering because what? When sin came into the world, Romans 5, 12, that's what it tells us. As by one man, sin entered into the world, Adam. And death passed upon all men. You see that? When Adam sinned, death. My brothers and sisters. So, they are what Paul described in greater detail as the suffering of Christ. For as the suffering of Christ, Paul said, abounded us, so our consolation also abounded by Christ. 2 Corinthians 1 5. The suffering of Christ are suffering to come upon us. Those who those who hate Christ makes up the object. They make us the object of their hatred. They let us know that they don't care for us. They, they, they look at us like those leaders that Stephen was speaking to in Israel. They, they gnash their teeth. They, 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 you, you become the object of their hatred. My brothers and sisters, the suffer for Christ's sake and being looked upon as a filth of the world and the offscoring come from living godly in Christ Jesus. Suffering for Christ's sake or suffering from the satanic policy of evil against us. As Satan vents his anger and takes out on the body of Christ that which he cannot take out on Christ himself. Hence, this kind of suffering is very special in nature and we need to recognize it as distinct from the sufferings of this present time. So don't get them confused. Don't get them mixed up. When you deal with sickness, when you deal with deaths, when you deal with catastrophic events, don't, don't get that mixed up with the sufferings for Christ's sake. You see, hence, this suffering is very special in nature and we need to recognize it. So in reality, many believers think they are suffering for Christ when they are not. Yet much more than this, suffering for Christ's sake need to be recognized by as a privilege of God's grace, a gift given to us of God, a grace by which we are granted the marvelous opportunity to actually glorify God and magnify Christ in our bodies, whether it be by life or death. My brothers and sisters, which is the exact opposite of adversary's intention in causing us to suffer. And this is something we should want and something, and it's something about which we should not be ashamed to glory of God. Now look at Philippians 1.29. For unto you is given in behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also suffer for his sake. Having that same conflict which you saw in me and now you're here to be in me. In Philippians 1.29-30, Paul taught the saints at Philippi that they needed to realize that it was truly a gift and a privilege of God's grace unto them to suffer for the cause of Christ as they were doing. For unto you is given on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. See, a lot of folks stop right there in that verse. Not only to believe on him, that's where a lot of folks stop at. A lot of folks stop. They believe that Jesus Christ died, buried, rose again from the dead, uh, dead, rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. They believe that and they're saved. They justify eternal life. A lot of them stop right there. So they sitting down. They done sat down in the pews for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years now. But they don't, they don't continue with the verse. But also to suffer for his sake. You see? having that same conflict which you saw in me and now you're hearing me. The Philippian saints were having, my brothers, this is some difficulty with it, especially now that they're suffering, including having the same conflict Paul was experiencing. Nevertheless, they're suffering and are suffering for Christ's sake. It's indeed a gift and a privilege of God's grace unto them at that time and unto us. We need to realize that suffering is given to us and we need to respond properly. Instead of murmuring and complaining, Apostle Paul said we need to rejoice. Instead of not wanting to suffer, 
We need to have Paul's attitude to suffer and his attitude about how we are looked upon as the filth of the world. Like I said, folks probably thought Apostle Paul was a crazy man with all the beatings and all the suffering he went through. And they looked up and they saw Paul coming again. Fool for Christ's sake, Apostle Paul. He didn't murmur. He didn't complain. He didn't murmur and complain when God says, Paul, I'm not moving that thorn in the flesh, but my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. Then Paul said, most gladly, I glory in my infirmities. You see here, what kind of attitude that you have when you rest in what God can do? Your attitude change about suffering. You look forward to being persecuted. Suffering was given to Paul. Paul's attitude, suffering, his attitude about how we are looked upon as the filth of the world. He welcomed it. Suffering was given to Paul and Paul willingly accepted it, which many do not do today. They don't accept it. They don't want it. They complacent. Many saints are complacent. They happy right where they are. But guess what? One day you got to stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. And you're going to give account of all your deeds and everything you've done in this old body. Your service, your service record is going to come up. Just like you have an evaluation at work. Guess what? Your service record as a saint, as a believer in the body of Christ, it's going to come up. My brothers and sisters, what did you do for Christ's sake? And let us stop there for the night. Let us pray. Father, here we thank you for your word. We pray as those listening, pray they're encouraged, that they're enlightened, that they're edified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.